This is a brief video on bone and cartilage tumors. In this video, we're going to be talking about benign and malignant neoplasms of hard tissues, hard tissues being bone and cartilage. Before we begin, we have here a picture of a tumor. This is one of the few tumors that kind of sticks out of the bone like this and is prominent and able to be seen outside the body. Uh, this is likely an osteochondroma, the third one on the list there on the left, and we'll be talking about that kind of tumor as well as many more. Before, let's, uh, before we begin, let's break down this chunk of uh, tumors on the left into two groups. The first five or six there are benign tumors, while the last three are malignant. So we're going to work our way down and try to learn something about each of them. Let's begin with the osteoma. The osteoma is a, uh, is a benign tumor of bone. Uh, it's typically a tumor of the skull or facial bones. You can see that image there uh, next to that nasal bone. We have an osteoma growing out of it. This can obstruct the nose or sinuses, as we see in that picture there, and you can get infections as a result of an osteoma, not to mention breathing problems. Osteoma is associated with Gardner syndrome, and just to remind you, Gardner syndrome is FAP, familial adenomatous polyptosis, and uh, that's a series of large intestine polyps, as well as having cancers outside the GI tract, so thyroid, liver, and kidneys cancers. So that combination of FAP as well as cancers outside the GI tract are characteristic of Gardner's syndrome, and those are associated with osteomas. Next is osteoid osteoma. This is another benign bone-forming tumor. This is one of the few tumors that occurs in the cortex of the bone, uh, also called the peripheral bone. And this is uh, as opposed to the central bone or the medulla of the bone. So as you can see in this cross-section of the lower leg, uh, most likely, this might, be the, uh, this might be the tibia up here, this might be the fibula, and you can see that there's an osteoid osteoma, and it's on the cortex of the bone. It's toward the edge as opposed to in the middle. It occurs in the diaphysis of bone, which is the middle section of bones. This usually happens in young patients, patients that are less than 25 years old. Uh, it's more common in males than females. On radiography, as we saw, you see a mass of dense, or, or a mass of dense origin of the tumor. This is called the nidus, and there's also an opaque cortical border of reactive sclerotic bone. So you can see around that there's sclerotic bone around that central nidus. The reactive rim of sclerotic bone surrounding the tumor is a good hint that it's benign, and this tumor is usually less than two centimeters in diameter. Clinically, this presents as bone pain, especially pain at night. Uh, what's characteristic of osteoid osteoma is that it's usually described as excellent relief with NSAIDs. So a person would complain of bone pain, especially at night, and when they take an aspirin or an ibuprofen, their pain goes away immediately, um, and usually for the duration of the active time of that aspirin, so four to six hours before the pain comes back. It's excellent relief with NSAIDs. Um, if this person does not have relief with NSAIDs, this this tumor can be treated with radiofrequency ablation. On histology, we see immune or immature appearing bone with fibrovascular tissue, active osteoblasts and osteoclasts in the nidus, and no cellular atypia or mitotic features. And we'll show a picture of that here. So again, immature appearing bone, uh, you see osteoblasts and osteoclasts working in the nidus, and there should not be any mitotic figures or cellular atypia. Uh, you can also see anastomosing bony trabeculae. These are like the trabeculae of the bone um, that are anastomosing, and this is characteristic of osteoid osteoma. Next is osteochondroma. This is a benign tumor of bone occurring where cartilage form bones. That means that it's occurring at the metaphysis or the growth plate. Tumors here create a bony projection or outgrowth from the surface of the bone. This outgrowth is called an exo exostosis with cartilaginous caps. So imagine the, the, the bony, or imagine the, the, the growth plate of a bone, and you have something sticking out laterally to the growth plate of the bone. And that uh, outward protrusion has a cap on top made of cartilage. That's an osteochondroma. The exostosis is continuous with the main bone marrow. Uh, so that means that the bone that's in that projection is continuous with the bone marrow that is in the main healthy bone. This is the most common benign bone tumor, uh, and it happens in young patients less than 25 years old, males more than females again. Uh, clinically, this is non-tender, firm, immobile mass protruding from the normal end of a long bone. If it protrudes far enough, you could feel it on the skin outside the body, as we saw in that first picture of this video. 
On histology, it looks like a growth plate. It's the same histology as a growth plate. This can rarely progress to a chondrosarcoma. Um, this is pretty uncommon for 30 years of age. And the treatment of this is to observe. And as long as it's asymptomatic, as long as the patient is complaining, it's not a big deal. You can resect if it is symptomatic. Next is non-ossifying fibroma. This is also known as a fibroxanthoma or a fibrous cortical defect. Um, fibrous cortical defect also describes a smaller version of the non-ossifying fibroma, but oftentimes those terms are used interchangeably because the pathophysiology is similar. This is a fibrous bone lesion. It's debatable whether or not this is a neoplasm or just a bone growth disorder. This occurs in the cortex of bone, and it's usually in adolescents and young adults. On radiography, you see sharp borders, an eccentric lobulated or septated mass around the metaphysis area, usually against the cortex, uh, especially of the tibia or the femur of the leg, the weight-bearing bone of the leg, with a thin sclerotic rim of bones with no periosteal reaction. Usually people don't complain about this. It's usually an incidental finding on an x-ray for another reason. On histology, you see fibrous tissue, as the name non-ossifying fibroma might imply, which is a disorganized bunch of collagen. It's adjacent to the normal bone. Um, you might see foam cells, you might see world fibrous tissue, and the radiography kind of has a world appearance too. I think we'll show you a picture of that in a second. Um, the treatment for this is that there's no intervention uh, and it should go away normally. In most patients, it just naturally involutes. But while it's there, it can make your bone weak, and that can make you, uh, could make you susceptible to pathologic fractures. So here are some radiographic images of non-ossifying fibroma. You can see the eccentric lobulated uh, septated masses here laying against the cortex as we said here in the tibia. Um, and there's a thin sclerotic rim of bone surrounding it. Um, that's a hint that it's benign, that it's not spreading. And there's no periosteal reaction. The periosteal um, is surrounding the larger bone. There's no reaction outside. So it's not really poking through or causing any kind of pressure to that periosteum. Next is giant cell tumor. This is also known uh, by its acronym GCTOB or osteoclastoma is a fun name for it because it's essentially a, uh, a proliferation of osteoclasts or cells that have osteoclast-like activity. So as we said, it's a tumor of osteoclast-like cells or multinucleated giant cells and bone stromal cells. This arises from the epiphyseal plate after closure and it extends to the articular surface, the epiphysis region, usually around the knee. So usually in the tibia or the, or the femur surrounding the knee. This is usually benign, but it can be locally aggressive. 2% actually become malignant, and this often spreads to the lungs. This happens in patients in the ages of 30s to 50s Clinically, patients come in with pain and swelling of the limb. On radiography, you see a soap bubble appearance with a radiolucent, but no matrix calcification. Uh, you do see no reactive sclerosis, no periosteal reaction, and this usually extends to the cartilage through the epiphysis. So you can kind of see it here. There's like a, this is a giant cell tumor in the epiphysis of this long bone of the hand. This might be a, uh, uh, metacarpal of the hand, probably, and that's uh, a giant cell tumor in the epiphysis there. On histology, you see no atypia. The giant cells look like elongated stromal cells with oval nuclei. We'll see a picture of that in a second. And these on histology are what would spread aggressively. Treatment here is curettage and grafting um, and cementing that, uh, that missing piece of the bone. So you resect it all out. You kind of carve it out and you put some cement in there to main strain st structure. Alternatively, you can completely resect to the entire bone, uh, but this does, of course, cause mechanical dysfunction or can cause mechanical dysfunction in that limb. A uh, drug that has been proposed that might work for a giant cell tumor is denosumab, which is a rank L inhibitor. Uh, so it inhibits osteoclast activity that way, and uh, there's, that's currently being investigated. So here's the histology, the non-atypia giant cells that look like elongated stromal cells with oval nuclei. You can kind of see these oval nuclei in these giant cells here in the histology of giant cell tumor. Next up is the chondroma. The chondroma can be broken down into two subcategories, the echondroma and the enchondroma. We'll be talking about the differences between the two. The enchondroma is more prevalent, so we'll focus on that one. But chondromas in general are benign tumors of cartilage with lobular growing patterns. These tumors resemble cartilage and produce a cartilaginous matrix, and they arise from the medulla of long bones. These most often occur in the long bones of the hands or feet. So if you see a tumor in the hands, you got to think chondroma. 
This is the most common tomb with hands, as we said. So as I said, chondroma is an umbrella term containing echondroma and enchondroma. We're going to talk about them separately and some unique characteristics of each, mostly enchondroma, in which the tumor grows within the bone and expands the bone. So the tumor grows inside the bone and exerts an outward pressure from inside the bone. Uh, enchondromas are characterized by central calcifications within the bone, in the medulla of the bone, with no cortical breakthrough. Um, so they are still benign. They are not breaking through the cortex of the bone. On radiography, we see a radiodense mass. We see rings and arcs, sometimes described as popcorn, sometimes described as snowflakes, or sometimes described as having a stippled appearance. Uh, those are all terms that should, uh, that, should, that should scream enchondroma when you hear them or see those those patterns on radiography. They're often found incidentally. Um, usually these things don't cause pain. Um, they aren't the reason for the x-ray and the treatment is thus just observation. On histology, we see bland histology with a few cells, no atypia, nothing too significant there. If these are painful, you can remove them by curettage. It's usually not necessary. Um, usually just observe them, know they're there, monitor if they're growing or causing any pain in the future. They can rarely malignant. Uh, they can rarely malignantly transform into chondrosarcomas, um, and this is pretty rare, um, even in the hands and feet. Lastly, is the echondroma, which is the other variant. Um, it grows outward from the bone. This is a rarer variant of the chondroma, probably less important to know than the N chondroma. These are some pictures of an N chondroma. We see the bland histology with few cells and no cellular atypia on the left. On the right, we see that popcorn-like appearance. You can kind of see it out there. I'm outlining it with a pointer now. Um, this is, might be described as a snowflake or a popcorn shape. Um, it's just like a little radio-dense area in the long bone, and that's an N chondroma. Now let's talk about the malignant tumors of bone. Let's begin with osteosarcoma. This is an important one to know. It's also called osteogenic sarcoma. It's an aggressive tumor. It's a malignant neoplasm of bone with mesenchymal origins and osteoblast differentiation. So it's gonna be mostly osteoblastic. It's mostly going to build bone. This occurs in the metaphysis of long bones. That's around the growth plate, usually around the knee. So usually in the femur or the tibia surrounding the knee. These are most common in teens and also common in the elderly. So they have two peaks of incidence. The biggest peak of incidence is in the teenage years. Uh, there's another smaller peak of incidence in the elderly above 65 years old. This is the second most common malignant bone tumor. There are several risk factors associated with osteosarcoma. These might be important to, to associate with osteosarcoma. That's Lee Fermini syndrome, familial retinoblastoma, uh, bone injury, infarction, or radiation, as of course you might expect, and also Paget's disease of bone, which is a problem with the osteoclast osteoblast balance in the bone where uh, the cycling is messed up and you get cementing lines on histology of the uh, of the bones. Paget's disease is well worth knowing and it's worth associating with osteosarcoma as well. Clinically, patients come in with a deep, aching bone pain, uh, oftentimes at night, oftentimes when they're resting. There might also be swelling of the limbs and a growing soft tissue mass around the knee, especially. This can also cause patients to limp. Patients on their labs might have an elevation in alkaline phosphatase. And as you know, that's you can kind of think of that as a general marker of bone building. And if these osteosarcomas have osteoblast activity, it makes sense that alkaline phosphatase would be elevated. Um, that also kind of connects with Paget's disease of the bone that also has an elevation in alkaline phosphatase. On radiography, you do see expansion into the soft tissue of this bone formation. Um, that kind of makes a sunburst pattern. Um, so the, the, the bone expands from the inside of the bone outwards into the soft tissue, and it kind of looks like sun rays uh, popping out of the bone there. There are poorly defined borders, which makes sense. This is a malignant neoplasm. You also see periosteal elevation. This is sometimes called a Codman triangle. Um, this is when you're pushing outward on the bone. There's an outward pressure being exerted from within the bone so much that the periosteum kind of bends upward and makes a triangle shape, or at least an angle looking shape. And this often destroys the cortex. So uh, like we have in Paget's disease of the bone, there's both osteoblastic and osteoclastic activity here. Periosteal sarcoma is stuck on compared to the osteochondroma. So earlier we said with osteochondroma that the, the bone within the osteochondroma is continuous with the marrow of the normal bone. Here it's kind of stuck on as opposed to, uh, as, as opposed to continuous with the rest of the bone.
or poorly defined borders here, as we said. That's a hint that it's malignant. In our histology, you see atypical pleomorphic malignant spindle cells producing osteoid or bone. Treat here is surgical resection. You also got to combine that with certain uh, chemotherapy drugs like methotrexate, adriamycin, cisplatin. Um, you can also try to salvage chemotherapy. These are more desperate measures to resolve this tumor, ephosphamide and etoposide. This is a picture of histology of osteosarcoma in the center and right of the image. You can see the osteosarcoma here, uh, kind of on the top right of the image. You see the poorly differentiated tumor cells. You see all kinds of cellular atypia region here. Uh, in the middle here is osteoid, and uh, this is relatively normal bone compared to the tumor up here. This is really where the atypia is. So another malignant tumor of bone. This is Ewing's sarcoma, also called Ewing's sarcoma with an S. Um, a guy named Ewing characterize this. This is a malignant tumor made of small round blue cells. These are poorly differentiated cells. This uh, usually causes bone destruction in the diaphyseal or metadiaphyseal location, so somewhere between the metaphyseal and diaphyseal location of the bone or closer toward the diaphyseal location. This is caused by a specific chromosomal translocation, specifically the T1122 translocation. This creates a fusion protein EWS FLI1. I don't know if the name of that protein is as important, but you should definitely associate that translocation, T1122 translocation associated with Ewing sarcoma. If you're a fan of basketball, a uh, former basketball player in the NBA, Patrick Ewing's number was 33, which is the sum of 11 and 22. That's kind of nice. We're not really sure where this tumor originates from. It's likely neuroectodermal. This tumor happens in teenagers, uh, less than 15 years old often, and uh, young adults as well. Um, it's more prevalent in males by a factor of 1.6 to 1. Clinically, we see increased white blood cells, increased erythrocyte sedimentation rate, which is, of course, just a general marker of inflammation. This disease kind of mimics osteomyelitis in this sense because of the increased white blood cells and the increased sed rate. On radiography, there's the characteristic onion skin appearance. This is when the bone, again, pushes out, uh, exerts an outward pressure from the inside of the bone to the periosteum, and it kind of causes the periosteum to, to regenerate bone in layers, and that looks like an onion skin on x-ray. Uh, we'll see a picture of that in a second. There's a broad zone of transition between the tumor and the non-tumor here, and if it exerts enough pressure, it could break through that periosteum and cause a Codman triangle, as we briefly see described in osteosarcoma. These, again, have no reactive sclerotic rims. Uh, that's a hint that they're malignant. They often occur in the femur, ilium, humerus, and tibia, as indicated in that picture on the right. The, the bones that you see in purple there are the ones where uh, the Ewing sarcoma most often happens. On histology, you see small round blue cells, as we said earlier. There's no atypia, but these are high-grade cells. It, they usually confuse with the neuroblastoma and lymphomas, so it's important to be able to differentiate those. These are pretty responsive to chemotherapy, especially when you combine chemotherapy with radiation, as is the case with many cancer treatments today. So let's look at this onion skinning appearance in the tibia, Ewing sarcoma in the tibia. You can kind of see that this periosteum is not normal. There's like a lighter shade and a darker shade. It kind of kind of looks like it's divided into rows, divided into layers, and that's the characteristic onion skin appearance. Here you see the small blue cells, large nuclei to uh, cytoplasm ratio. That's characteristic of Ewing sarcoma. No atypia, but they're definitely high grade cells. And lastly, we're going to talk about the chondrosarcoma. This is a malignant neoplasm of cartilage. Uh, it can often uh, rise as a continuation or a progression of the osteochondroma, but it can also rise spontaneously itself. This is the chondrosarcoma. Maybe not as important to know as the other tumors on this list, but still worth going over briefly. This is a slow growing tumor, but it does grow and can grow to become pretty substantial in size and exert pressure on surrounding structures. This most often affects the axial or central skeleton, including the pelvis, the spine, and the scapula. Um, it also it, it, it rises in the metaphysis, usually um, in the medulla of the metaphysis near the growth plate. This happens in older patients, patients that are usually over 60 years old. On radiography, we see a stippled pattern suggesting cartilage, lid changes, cortical involvement, and scattered calcifications. So that stippled pattern can give you a hint that you're looking at cartilage on radiography um, and that it's a chondrosarcoma.
on histology, you see increased cellularity, as you might see with a lot of neoplasms. Um, this is especially compared to chondro, uh, the, the chondroma. Uh, you might see some atypia here and some areas of necrosis as well. Treatment here is surgical resection or amputation. Unfortunately, chemotherapy or radiation does not work as well for chondrosarcoma. It might have something to do with the fact that it's arising from cartilage, but surgical resection or amputation are your best options. Survival rate is usually 50 to 75% for chondrosarcoma. Mm -hmm. This has been a brief video on tumors of hard tissues. Uh, that's tumors of the bones and the cartilage. I hope this review was helpful, and thank you for listening.